us. Um, but I think it's interesting uh, to at least just go back and think about uh, how we've delivered uh, software, because I most certainly believe that there's some sort of paradigm shift about to happen, and we all have some sort of memory of how it used to be, say, a good two decades ago, for where if I wanted a piece of software installed, I would go to my desktop, and I would install it on that desktop, and if I ever wanted to use that specific piece of software, I would have to go back to that desk, and that is where it would work. And then a decade later, somehow Salesforce came along, and told us that that is not really necessary. It is something for where you need a set of credentials. You can access it in the cloud, and whether that be at home or at work, and that will be a new paradigm. Even to the extent today for where we're all a little bit confused if our provider doesn't provide us a web service for where Citibank told me, you know what, we don't have web banking. That would not even, that would be kind of like a response for where I wouldn't understand, like, so uh, what do you mean, as in? I can't access you on the internet. So that's certainly a paradigm that we got used to. And then, short of a kind of decade later, Apple somehow told us that, you know what, there's an app for that. You don't need to be at some laptop or desktop and access on the web. You can be in line at Starbucks and get access to your information. And whether we believe in that specific uh, segmentation, there's certainly some shift from a very kind of static environment to a very kind of mobile environment. And I think they're all wonderful. And it's not that I don't love the 119 apps on my iPhone right now. I just can't see that really be the future. So I think the next paradigm is one for where we'll see intelligent agents arrive. And we can debate long and hard about whether we call them intelligent agents or conversational agents or no UI or invisible software or something else. And it doesn't even matter because I won't get to kind of uh, baptize that. But it will be something which is certainly different to what we've put in place over the prior kind of almost kind of half century. And I think this setting here is one for where, and we talk about it as invisible software around the office, for where it's not immediately clear how you interact with it. Because it's an agent for where it used to be, certainly in the old paradigm, for where I needed to understand the objective, what I want done, learn some sort of syntax, whether that be command line or drop down or a input box or a check box or a set of radio buttons. And once I understand that, I can work towards my objective. In this new setting, you somehow at least initially need to Tell the agent, what is it that I want you to do for me? And once you told the agent what you want done, it needs to be able to run away and work on that given objective. And that means there's nothing which you can touch here. And I think in many settings, that just becomes obvious. Um, if you take a self-driving car, if I've told it at some point in the not too distant future that I want to go from Wall Street to Midtown, I certainly don't want some setting halfway there for where they expect me to click a radio button, or I die. I want to really just go from here to there, and I assume you understood that, and I can look away. Oh, you didn't see the checkbox, now you die. Um, so, so there needs to be some new setting here for where we see the syntax disappear, and we have to create some sort of moment for where people move from thinking in little tasks to jobs. And I think as we move towards that setting, there's two choices that comes up as you kind of create this agent. One is, do you choose to create it as a traditional piece of software for where there's a specific way that you hand over or describe that objective in some syntax? Or do you humanize it? As in, we already have some understanding of how we hand over jobs to employees, partners, and colleagues, and what have you. I am very much, and you can call bullshit if you want to, uh, a fan of the idea of humanizing the agent. Because in that way, we completely democratize the idea of giving access to software. So it's not that my mom doesn't understand that you can manipulate a picture in Photoshop. It's that she doesn't have the skill set to go into a list of drop downs where you have hundreds and hundreds of options to manipulate that kind of image. She can do some things on her iPhone, but she certainly has in mind the job she would like done when she look at that picture, for where she could say that out loud. 
and some agent could take that over. I happen to be in a particular space for where we spent the last two years, 60 propeller heads in the basement working on this one agent in the dark, and we're not in market yet. Um, and it's hard, but we chose to humanize her. Uh, and we can talk about uh, the value points of that. And what I really like about this choice is that there's many choices for where it's suggested to be one, but it's so gray that you're not sure what people really picked. This will be black and white. You can't be anything in between. You either have to be Google Now, Siri on this side, or Amy Ingram as is the name of our agent. You can't be somewhere in the middle for where I talked to you a little bit, but now you want a syntax. Either you've been humanized or you have not. And that I like. And that's an upfront decision with dramatic ramifications in the way you engineer your agent. And we chose to humanize her. And I want to give you just a couple examples of what that looks like and what it means and uh, the interesting parts of the functions which you need to put in place in your company if you want to support such a thing. I'm actually super eager to kind of hear the next speaker who seems to kind of overlap with one of the functions that we put in place, which is that when you choose to humanize her, if you and I were to kind of sit together this weekend and hack together some app and put it on the app store, we would hire or employ or call some friends that did UI, UX, information architecture, all kind of well-defined jobs that we could go find. Who do you hire to humanize your agent? What do they look like? They're not pixel pushers. There's no color. There's no button. There's just some entity here which is probably closer to that uh, brand person at Prada that tried to define who is it that we're trying to sell to and what do they look like and how do we define that persona. And here's the really funny thing. Uh, we can talk about that in detail. So I ended up hiring this. So we're all data scientists on one side. But on the other side, I hired this uh, Harvard drama major to create this character. Because I think the worst thing you could do here, uh, and I think we have wonderful engineers, uh, good friends of mine, but you cannot have a bag of templates or a bag of scenarios or some dialogue model that spits out text and then believe that that creates a persona. That's really just technically correct text that comes out for where the grammar is hopefully better than my Danish English. But it's something which people can understand. It's not humanizing it, though. That's really just moving from pixels to text. And we invested heavily in trying to come up with something for where if you spoke to Amy today, yesterday, six months ago, two weeks from now, you have a relationship, hopefully, if we've done our job well. If you have to cancel a meeting, you feel a little bit sorry about it, and you want to add some sort of apology here. If you're late to reply to her, you feel guilty, and you need to kind of make up for it. And if we succeed in that, then we created something for where the agent can participate in this universe for where most of the actors are actually human, given all the guests and the hosts that we interact with. So that's us, and I'm looking forward to you kind of uh, calling bullshit on it, and we can discuss it. I want to give you a couple of uh, examples here. So um, this happens all the time. So we run this kind of daily Turing test for where thousands and thousands of people are having these discussions with our agent, and they have been told, and this I find really interesting, pause, have you all seen the movie Ex Machina? I'm sure half of you have, right? So at the very beginning of the movie, he brings in Caleb, the one engineer, who is supposed to kind of go do really this touring test, right, over the duration of the movie. And he immediately says, but I can see it's a robot, so that's the end of the test. You know, I've told you already. And he then says, the other character, that is it. I will tell you up front this is a machine. And once I told you, I want to see if you can get a human relationship with it. We do the same. So we're not trying to fool people or deceive them into believing that this might actually just be a human in the other end or 10,000 people in the Philippines. No, I tell you, this is machine. And then see if we can create a relationship. And that I find interesting. This is just a very simple one. 
happens all the time, that we've had this kind of very long dialogue over days for where we're trying to set up a meeting, multiple participants, and they always say at the end, so Amy, will you be joining us? Uh, no, I won't. Uh, we can print out a picture, you can put that in the whiteboard, but I won't be joining you. And even in those settings here, we need to come up with something for where we don't degrade the relationship. And you can see we continue, even though we reveal the fact now that we are a machine, to have this idea of a relationship for where, thank you very much for your kind invitation. That could have been a syntax error, right, for where, no, not possible to attend given I'm a machine, exclamation point. But we build on that even in this uh, scenario here. We also see this here, especially on cancellations. And we all do this, right? So each one of us in here, unless you won some sort of corporate lottery and you got your own human personal assistant, good for you. The rest of us, we're on our own. And in that setting, when we cancel meetings, we half sell it. And I'll bet you, if I go and look at your inbox, we don't do the whole, I'm canceling the meeting today. We might do it next week. No, we do the whole, uh, my dog, my wife, my kids, the weather, Scots will, Allah, the whole thing. You know, we're writing, you know, three paragraphs, but I can't make it at 11. That's really what it's all about. We see the same thing here for where they know, because they've been told that this is a machine. Why do they write an apology? It's not like Amy will put some sort of additional set of attributes on the cancellation because you wrote in that, I am just so sorry, something has come up unexpectedly and we need to reschedule. You could just write reschedule and that would be the end of it. But they don't. I don't. I bloody work there. And I still somehow don't have it in me just to write reschedule because over the last two years I've been creating this in my mind relationship with this agent for where reschedule, exclamation point. Who the fuck are you, Dennis? That doesn't sound right. And then I write it out a little bit. I start almost all my requests to Amy with, would you be so kind? How much time do I have in my day to write, would you be so kind? Why don't I just jump into the idea of, Tommy, Michael, early next week, please. Oh, sorry, not even please, just next week. So that we see happen all the time as well. We again see uh, this idea of wanting to keep her in the loop on things that aren't even necessary for the meeting, but I feel obligated to make sure that you are equally aware of what's about to happen as all of the other participants. So that aside, I just want to give you one stat here. So it's not just all, I found a couple of good examples. Um, and outside of this, I'll tell you. Uh, so we get this all the time at the office. So we get flowers, chocolates, whiskey, Red Bulls, what have you. You should see my Instagram feed, which is really just like, that guy is loved. But it's not really me. It's uh, being sent uh, for Amy. But I have one stat here, which is, and this is certainly to me kind of quite staggering, uh, given the facts that I just told you, that everybody's being advertised up front that this is machine-driven. In 11% of all the meetings which we do, at least one email in that dialogue have only one intent. So we're really in the kind of intent prediction space for where I need to predict the intent, as in what is it you want me to do for you? set up new meeting, add participant, make you optional, running late, all those things that can happen in a meeting. But in 11%, all they wanted was just to give Amy a virtual pat on the back, meaning that this is not even just part of the dialogue. That is as in the meeting has already been set up, everything's completely hunky-dory. But then you write an extra email saying, hey, thanks, Amy, you're a real sweetheart. That's sweet. Again, why do you write that? I appreciate all your help, Amy. Perfect, I received the invite. You should, that's kind of my job, right? You know, I'm the assistant, I set up meetings, and if you don't receive the invite, you know, I'm not a good assistant. But they felt compelled to write that to her, 11%. We're doing hundreds of thousands of uh, meetings here. We're not talking about, I call up 10 friends, and you know, two of them somehow wrote something back. 
it is so massive that what we thought would be a system completely void of emotion has some emotion baked into it. And actually so much so that we've had to kind of create models for gratitude. And, and this is kind of the, uh, the geeky part uh, of it, which is that in a lot of gratitude, uh, when we do intent prediction on that, what you'll see is that people will include temporal data. And our whole system, really, given that we set up meetings about dates and times and so on and so forth, but people will say things like, have a great weekend. <laughs> Why did you say that? I will kind of detect the intent this weekend, I'll extract it, and now I need to know that you're not trying to push the meeting into the weekend, or have a lovely week, great, I need to now have a model to make sure that it is just gratitude. But that we see throughout, and I'm just going to leave you with this kind of one last uh, very uh, funny uh, thing which we see again all the time. By the way, Amy, are you free for a pre-Christmas drink one evening? How do you respond to that? Uh, her signature, and when I say we expose this, it, it's right there in her signature. Not kind of like uh, if you went to the uh, terms conditions page, you might be able to kind of spot it on you know, page 47. It is there. It says, Amy, return. Artificial intelligence, blah, blah, blah. And we get to this setting here. Again, we are... Uh, quite polite in the way we uh, respond to people. I've been thinking about myself, I should just turn up for all these dates and just uh, take the drinks as part of my compensation. <laughs> so with that, and just in one closing, if you want uh, at least one reason uh, to do this, um, which I think is worthwhile, and one reason for where you just end better off if you're in the space of creating agents. So we've all kind of read the same papers, and there's actually some really interesting studies on how we've seen kids using uh, Siri, and it's not Siri, but that is just the one that they've done studies on, for where there is no penalty for being an asshole, as in, if my kids tell me something which is not right, I will tell them that is not cool. Uh, and there's a penalty. There's no penalty with the agent in your pocket. And there's a decrease in the level of empathy in those tests that they've seen with those kids for where there's been spent additional time with these agents. I am so happy to see that we've been able to create a system here for where we are not void of any emotion, that it actually does exist in the system, and we can engineer against it, as in we can keep it intact. So that just makes me happy, because I think we could end up just degrading as humans if we have these systems for where there are no penalty for being an asshole. So that's the one part. The other part is, and, and this is going to sound quite cold, it's just better data. So we get to extract a much more rich data set if we humanize it, because the way you describe things are so much more rich that I can tease out any potential urgency or what have you in the way that you talk to Amy. Make sure that Dennis and I meet up when I'm in New York next week. Suggest that it is not the week after. It must be this week, and we should do our utmost space, best to kind of make sure that that happens. Or, yeah, sure, let's have a drink uh, one of these evenings. That doesn't mean the next two evenings. That means until March we might have a drink. And that is just a much richer, richer data set and actually makes it a little bit easier for us to that, uh, to that regard. So that's my short story. Thank you very much.